right, we're continuing in our series on uh, healthy relationships, building emotionally healthy relationships, the ties that bind. We're going to invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. And we're going to spend a good chunk of our time in this passage of scripture. And I just want to appreciate everyone who has helped uh, support the uh, Bailey Langeloff family, Kariga and Felicia and the whole soul development family as uh, they have over the last month uh, mourned the loss of their uh, little baby girl who uh, was stillborn. And it certainly has been a, a super uh, difficult season for all of us, uh, appreciating that uh, tragedies happen. And, 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 you know, I was saying yesterday that, uh, you know, often you can grow up in church or be around church people, and uh, we are often uh, trying to protect God when God don't need no protection. And we'll make up all these statements about how God needed to take a flower out of this garden and put it in another garden, or God needed to take a baby and do it. And I, I just want folks to remember, God don't need to take a baby or a flower, you know. You know, sometimes bad things happen, and we'll spend most of the rest of our life trying to understand why. And so rather than offering platitudes and simplistic answers to very complex uh, situations, we just gonna walk with one another through our most difficult moments and trust and believe that as we walk together, the healing uh, that comes will bring a peace that passes all understanding. And uh, as the people of resurrection, we know that death never has the final say. And uh, so even though we experience loss, we know that resurrection is on the way. And uh, so we continue to pray for the family and all of us who uh, have lost and loved ones. I know that this has been a hard season of transition for you and for us. And so just be mindful that we're not a church that's trying to tell you uh, some, some, some platitudes. We, we want to walk with one another. We want to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice and stand with one another together. Give your neighbor a quick high five and tell them I'm standing with you. Amen. You're not by yourself. And uh, so we stay in prayer for them. Somebody holler, Lord, bless uh, Felicia, bless Kariga, bless their family. Amen and amen. All right, here we go. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter number four. Uh, we're uh, looking at this passage of scripture. We've been in this series four or five weeks or so. We got a few more weeks left. We are exploring what does it mean to be in emotionally healthy relationships. Uh, we are certainly on a day like today where all across the world we are uh, fellowshipping and joining in the celebration of All Saints Day as well. Uh, we talked about this several weeks ago that, as Dr. King says, we are all tied in a single garment of destiny, that we are all interrelated. We have connections with one another that even though you may want to believe you are a radical individual, uh, that you are influenced by people you can't see and people you do see. And so what does it mean for us to be in relationships of health with ourselves, with God, with one another, with the society we live in, uh, with the earth that we are called to steward, that all of these relationships are not healthy in and of themselves. How many have been in some unhealthy relationships before? Amen. I'm going to say before. I'm not going to say right now. I'm not trying to... <laughs> trying to get in nobody's business. <laughs> Amen. Well, we talking about before, and you know how, you know, you was all excited at the beginning of the relationship, and then you got into it, and he was like, Lord, if you can get me out this relationship. <laughs> but, 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 yes, yes, uh, come on back. We don't want you to live in the past. <laughs> but we do realize that there are some relationships that you may not be able to get out of, certainly not talking, the, you know, your personal relationships with your boo or, or a partner or a spouse. I mean, you can always get out of that relationship, especially if it's unhealthy to the point of violence or, or, or physical, verbal, emotional uh, violence. You don't, you don't need to be a part of that. But some of our relationships with your job, you may not be able to get out of that relationship, especially if you got a mortgage, amen. You have to keep showing up, be like, Lord, you're going to have to help me get through this one. Or you going to school and you paid your tuition already. You can't get out of that relationship. Somebody say amen. Or, or you know, you, you, you're going to be in some relationships, relationship with this country. Somebody say amen. Now, we could go back to our homeland, wherever that is. 
but that's a whole nother conversation for another day. And so sometimes we're going to have to figure out how do we exist in relationships that may not always be healthy, but how do we then do the work that allows us to not become the worst part of ourselves in relationship to those things that may not necessarily mean us good. That's been the kind of trajectory of this series. And so today, we're going to dive in a little bit deeper here and, and talk a little bit about uh, the practices that we can take to keep enduring and, dare I say, uh, 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 maximizing our, our, our life-giving existence in relationships of both health and sometimes unhealthy spaces. Second Corinthians chapter number four, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And Paul wrote a first letter. They didn't act right, so he wrote a follow-up letter. Amen. Amen. He said, I need to tell y'all something else about yourself because y'all going to mess up and lose this out. And I just always think we should appreciate when God puts people in our life that are willing to tell us the truth. Amen. So we can get ourselves together. Second Corinthians 4, I believe we're going to start at verse number 16. The scripture says, so we're not giving up. Amen. Tell you his neighbor, I'm not a quitter. Amen. We're not giving up. How could we, even though on the outside, it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside. Somebody say on the inside. Where God is making new life. Not a day goes by without God's unfolding grace. Woo, I could just run around the church on that one all by itself. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times. The lavish celebration God prepared for us. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today and gone tomorrow, but the things we can't see now will last forever. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So for the next few moments before we take our communion and Eucharist time, we're going to speak from the topic, there's more to me than what you see. There's more to me than what you see. Bow your heads and let's pray. God, we thank you for the word. That has been read for us today. It is a word that is intended to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Bless those that have gathered, Lord, to hear and to be encouraged. I pray that as I stand to preach and teach your word, that it will be done with the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. And may it be a blessing to us all. This we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Pat yourself on the chest say, there's more to me than what you see. Give your neighbor a high five and Lord, look at him. Just tell him there's more to you than what I see. Now, it, it is indeed the case that we are in the immediate aftermath of Halloween, where for me, it is a fascinating holiday. I don't know if it's a holy day, but it's a holiday where folk seem to lose all concern about what other people think about how they look. <laughs> it's a fascinating development, right, where you can go all year long obsessed about what other people think. But then on Halloween, it's kind of like, you know, you don't care. And uh, we will go through great lengths to spend money to look quite ridiculous. And uh, I, I, I always, you know, I don't do a lot of Halloween uh, dressing up be just because, you know, I, I just can't get into it that much. Uh, but but I, I do have a costume that I wear, uh, usually uh, it's my clergy collar and my Air Force Ones. I, I call that my costume when I got to go do minister or activist stuff, you know, because I put all that on because it, it helps people take me more seriously. Because, you know, most people think don't think I'm a preacher when they meet me. They be like, you ain't no preacher. I remember I went, I was trying to get into San Quentin. This is a true story. <laughs> trying to get into San Quentin to go visit some fellas there, and we were doing some work, 
And, and when you go to the prisons, uh, they have full discretion on if they will let you in. I mean, you got to go to the front door, and you can even you can be listed there. But they'll look at you, and they'll be like, not, no, not today. We can't let you in. They'll make up a reason. Oh, they rioting in there, so we can't let you. Gotta, you'd be like, no, they're not rioting. be like, sir, you're on prison ground. Okay, well, God bless you. I guess I'll see you, <laughs> see you next time. So I went three times trying to get in to prison, San Quentin, and on the list and went with some other people. I went one time and they let other people in and left me standing there at the gate. I was like, man, you know? And I, so I was, you know, well, I'm gonna go again. It was literally on Halloween. This is, I'm telling you, I'm not lying. I put on my clergy collar and stuff and I got in just like that, just walked right in, you know? And, and so when I was talking to the fellas, you know, I was like, so I'm here talking to y'all today in my costume, amen, because this is literally the only way it seems like I could get into the prison to talk to you. I had to look like a priest. And uh, it was fascinating because it seemed like that helped me that day. Uh, I remember I was going to preach or speak at, at, at General Hospital in San Francisco, and uh, my, my niece, not my niece, my cousin, Danielle, she's one of the most brilliant make brides that's been created, amen, in our family. She's like a, a doctor resident something, you know, one of the first black ones. You know, you smart when you were first black something, you know. <laughs> See, in our family, we, 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 we all preachers and musicians and, so, and teachers. And so I was like, ooh, we got, we got like a first black doctor up in this joint. Man, we making us famous for being more than preachers and teachers and singers. So I was so excited. She had me come speak on to her, 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 her comrades, her colleagues at the, at the hospital. And, and, and I, I, I walk in, and I have on my costume, you know, my, my clergy collar and everything, because, you know, I'm going to general hospital. And I walk in, and they meet me at the, at the door, and they're like, oh, Pastor McBride, so glad to have you. Ruh, 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 ruh. And so I, I was like, yeah, it's great to be here. And they're like prepping me, you know, you're going to be in a room full of the top leaders of the hospital, administrators and residents, doctors. How many of y'all watch ER? That's the only last, you know, all them, them big wigs. And I'm like, ooh, man, this is going to be amazing. You know, I get to talk to them about my gun violence work and talk about public health and all this stuff. So I walk in, and the first person that I meet is a woman with a knife sticking out of her head. And I just was like, Luke's here, Satan? Like, what is going on? And then I peek in there, and I see goblins, and I see X-Men, and I see, I, see, I see all kind of folk, and I forgot it was Halloween. And I was saying to myself, Man, y'all people here taking care of folk. I mean, folk, you walk in people's room, and they have a heart attacks looking at you. I mean, very highly intellectual folks. Maybe some of y'all is like this on Halloween. Just look ridiculous. It, 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 it is a fascinating thing that we spend one day out of the year and everybody agrees to bring out this other person. But I want to submit to you that some of us, maybe all of us, don't limit our costumes to one day a year. That for some of us, Halloween is a daily, year-long exercise where we are wearing all kinds of alternative, alternate people, identities, personalities, and we, 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 we rarely are showing up in the world as our authentic self. And it's important to appreciate, it's hard to be in a healthy relationship when you can't never show up as yourself. Man, I don't know, you know, if you, now some relationships, you, it's harder to be like, you know, your authentic self. It's like, you know, I, I can't show up to my job with my, you know, uh, my authentic home self. Right. You know, because that, that, I may not have this job very much longer, right? Or, you know, I'm, I, you know I, I, my parents, I love my parents, wonderful people, but they had their, like, parent self, parent costume, you know. Then they had their costume for other, you know, spaces and places. And, you know, if you're a parent, you know, sometimes your kids, they do things to you. Amen. They bring parts out of you you didn't know existed. Amen. You just so, 
you know, my, my, my children, God bless their heart, amen, they, they don't believe in cleaning up. I mean, they literally don't believe in it. Like, they'll come in the house, and they'll just start walking up the stairs, just disrobing, and just leave a trail. And I, I'm coming up the stairs, breaking my neck on shoes and, and, and coats and, 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 and shirts. And I'm like, what is this? Now, you know, I like to think I'm a patient person <clears throat> until I have to deal with kids that don't believe in cleaning up. I mean, I start hollering and screaming and threatening and all kind of things <laughs> over a shoe. <laughs> Touch your neighbor, somebody, right? <laughs> kids do things to you, right? But you can't, you can't have that kind of parent costume on everywhere. Imagine you went on your job and somebody left their cup out and you just talk to them like you talk to your kids. I told you to put this. <laughs> that in many respects, some of our costumes, some of our, our personalities, they are differentiated for particular places and spaces we're in. But it is still indeed the case that many of us don't always appreciate that there is more to us than what we are displaying to the average person. And one of our great challenges, I believe, is to keep remembering that God is trying over the course of our lives to get you to be comfortable enough in who God's created you to be, your most authentic self, so you can show up in ways that bring glory to God and gifts to the world. That every relationship you're in, it ought to be a life-giving experience. And for many of us, we can bear witness that not all of our relationships have ended up that way. And so because of that, we reorient ourselves and we are clear that if I show up here like this, then this may happen. So instead, I'm going to put on a little costume and I'm going to have Halloween in the spring. I'm going to have Halloween you know, in the summer. I'm going to have Halloween because this is what I need to do to survive. You know, it is uh, interesting and fascinating thing because part of what, when we were growing up in our church, we talked about saints just as much as we talked about demons. Yeah, like, you know, in, you know our church, everything was a demon. You had a lion demon. <laughs> you had an alcohol demon. You had a sleeping demon. You had a, you, 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 everything was a demon. So we talked about saints as well because we believe that it was important for the saints to be, you know, I have any, anybody here know what I'm talking about? I'm, some of y'all looking at me like, what are you talking about? Demons and saints and Halloween? Where are you going with this, pastor? I mean, just, just keep riding. I think we'll get somewhere, maybe. <laughs> but this day, first Sunday after Halloween, all across the world, people are celebrating All Saints Day. And All Saints Day is an opportunity for people who are following the ways of Jesus all across the world to be reminded, number one, that we are a part of a global community of people who are striving to listen, be our most authentic self, animated by the power and the presence of God at work in our lives. Now, in some of our Christian traditions, uh, uh, Catholicism and, 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 and Anglicans and, and the Orthodox tradition, they have sainthood. They have certain saints that they venerate. They appeal to them. They, they pray through them because they don't believe that time is limited to where we are today. And so they say, you know, I'm going to just offer a prayer because I know they're praying for me in eternity that I can win. And so folks spend time and they venerate these certain individuals because they've lived such a, a, a high exemplary life, not because they were perfect. And this is an important thing to appreciate, that perfection is not the equivalent of being a saint. Saints are people who even through their imperfections can still live and show up in their most authentic self and allow the power and the gifts of God to be animated and, 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 and emanating in a way that blesses more than them. 
And I want you and I to always appreciate that whether we're talking about saints uh, from a sainted point of view, a sainthood point of view, or whether we're talking about us as a communion of saints, all of us are being uh, refined by God so we can show up as our most authentic self. But it does require us to appreciate that we must know who we are authentically. And keep it real, some of us are not willing to walk that road with much integrity either. Hello, somebody, because we've gotten used to our costumes. So that's the first thing I want to lift up. What does it mean for you and I to appreciate that there's more to me than what you see? And part of the process of you seeing me fully means that I have to, first of all, lose my costume. Pastor Chef on the chest say, I need to lose my costume. Say that, I need to lose my costume. The scripture, verse number 18, it says that there is more for, or there's more here in you than meets the eye. I grew up loving Transformers. Any Transformer folks, Transformers, more than meets the eye, the Autobots face their battle to destroy the evil force of the Decepticons, Transformers. Anybody trans? No Transformer fans in the building. Some of y'all missing out. You know, they got new Transformers on Netflix just in case you missed out your whole life. I just want you to know that. But Transformers, very much a wonderful metaphor for many of us, that there's more to us that meets the eye, but we have these costumes on and we've layered ourselves in so many different ways that most people, including ourselves, don't get a chance to see the more than meets the eye. And so we'll get super kind of, you know, petty about other people's practices. I, I was hanging out with Pastor Tracy Blackman these last couple days. We were in uh, Chicago doing some work on uh, the Proctor Conference Board that we joined, and then we were at the Black Theology 50th anniversary thing, and Pastor Tracy, you know, folks was, you know, all on a high horse about uh, uh, Halloween, and she, she wrote this, this, this tweet out, and I liked it. I said, I'm going to use this in my sermon on Sunday. Pastor Tracy says, I wish all the super saved folk that think God is angry about children pretending to be characters on Halloween were as concerned about grown folk pretending to be Christian every other day of the week. Man, that's, that's, amen. That, you know, Pastor Tracy, she, she a flamethrower, man. You know, this stuff just rolls out of her. I'd be like, girl, I'd have had to sit up all night thinking of something that clever to say. And then the best part of her tweet was called Petty Piety. <laughs> you ever met somebody like that? They just majoring in what you got going on, right? Not realizing that they themselves got a lot of layers of costumes on. And it's keeping them from being their most authentic self. What we must appreciate is that our most authentic self is who God is trying to get you most comfortable with. And if you're in a relationship with someone, with something, with an institution, and you're not clear about who you are, that institution or even that person will do a mind job on you. And we can spend a whole lot of time talking about how that happens and why that happens, but I think most of us are clear that some of our deepest insecurities and our, our deepest uh, 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 anxieties about ourselves are, are not because we, we've always thought this way, but somebody put a trip on us. They, they, they told us something about us that, and, and we respected them and we felt the pressure to conform and, and that thing has stayed with us. And so because we don't want to, to, to be so vulnerable, we put on a costume or a mask. Can I talk about masks for a few moments? Master high, so we don't have to, you know, show up in places that we may feel unsafe. We grew up in the during the crack cocaine era of 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 of, of the eighties, nineties, and my mom, bless her heart, love my mom. She's a music teacher, and so you know she was teaching us all the Suzuki method on violin. And and I appreciate my dad, praise God, because you know we walking through the neighborhood with a violin on our back, you know. Catching a bus with <laughs> violins on our back. Uh, you got people out here, you know, taking folk to task. 
My dad said, no, son, y'all not going to walk. Y'all not going to be walking through on this point with a violin. We going to teach y'all how to play the drums and <laughs> play the organ. Because, you know, we understood that you can't just show up in certain places all, all just out there naked and, 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 and vulnerable because there are people out here that would take advantage of you. And so because of that, we've all learned how to put certain masks on. But how many know the more mask you put on, the, the, the easier it is to lose yourself? And you'll get so used to wearing the mask that you'll be more comfortable in the mask than you are in your authentic self. And so while you may have to wear some of these costumes or masks because you are in some places that are not vulnerable in relationship to the world, to society, how many know in your relationships you should never be in a relationship where you got to wear masks and costumes to feel safe? Uh, I know it's hard because some of these relationships, you know, you, you just in love. You just never, you just can't imagine yourself. You know, but, 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 but sometimes the hard work of losing your costumes will be both, both life-giving to you and the person you are in a relationship with. Yeah. And God, help us to not be in relationships with people that want us to show up in a mask yeah. rather than our most authentic self. So the first set of questions I want you to think about today, will the real you please stand up? All right, don't nobody stand up. Wait, man, it's not a literal. But it is some slim, shady theology up in here, right? We, we, we are in need of us to become much more clear about who we are and appreciate that the rest of your life is you and I being most comfortable with who we are, who God's created us to be, and with others, how God has created them to be. Because keep it real. God will not show you your authentic self all at one time. Because it'll just scare you too bad. <laughs> Man, God's going to need the rest of your life to kind of peel back that adolescent junk. That, wait, is that adolescence? Is adolescent teenage the same thing? Maybe so. Well, just when you're young. That, that young stuff. <laughs> that young adult stuff. That adult stuff, that first marriage, second marriage, third marriage, first job, third job, 10th job, flunked out, all these different parts of you that God is helping you to get comfortable with. It's kind of like uh, that the movie Big, maybe some Tom Hanks, and then it was another one called 13 to 30, where you know they, you, they go to sleep. They, they, go, they, 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 they go to sleep an adult, and then they wake up a kid. And that's how shocked some of us would be if God just showed you your authentic self all at one time. You go to bed, and you wake up, ah, what, 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 what? So God has to gradually, over time, show you and I the parts of ourselves that help us get more comfortable in our skin. And I want you to know, child of God, God needs you comfortable in your own skin. Because if you're not comfortable in your own skin, how is it that you can be comfortable with other real, authentic folk? Mm. Lose your costumes and your masks. That's the first point. Second point, uh, uh, you and I, if we're going to be uh, able to, to appreciate there's more to us than what we see is we got to explore some icebergs. Icebergs. Everybody know what an iceberg is, right? A big old floating piece of snow in the water, right? But, but or ice. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's ice. It looked like snow. <laughs> Just floating. But, 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 but as the text tells us that, that the, on the outside, it has this whole kind of look to it. But there's a whole nother thing going on underneath. And for many of us, we are always mistaking the tip of the iceberg 
for the whole of who we are that many of us will never see with most people we interact with. One of my uh, training classes for my master's uh, or my counseling class uh, degree program thing, uh, we, we, we were talking about how much, this is quite anecdotal I believe, but, but it, 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 it made sense to me out of my own experience, how many people at one time can you be in a real meaningful, intimate, deep relationship with. We, we kind of came to this kind of thought that, you know, you probably can't do it with more than four, five, six people at a time. Because, you know, uh, first of all, you don't have the time or the energy to get that deep in relationships with that many people. Amen. Because, you know, many of us, we only interact with people at the tip of the iceberg level. Right? You know, the, 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 the data tells us that uh, the part of the iceberg you see above the water is one-seventh of the total mass of an iceberg. That beneath the surface, there is six times more of mass that you'll never see unless you hit that joker. Then you, you're going to find out, man, this thing, this, this, there's a lot going on underneath the surface. Anybody ever felt that way about yourself? About the person you're in relationship with? There's a lot going on under the surface. And so I'm not going to deal with that. <laughs> let, let, let's just stay at the ice, tip of the iceberg. That, that, you know, we gonna, it don't look so nice. You, you take a picture of an iceberg, it's shiny. It's, Got all these nights. Oh, that's just so sweet. And you spend a lot of time fooling around with the tip of the iceberg. And you are interacting with other people, tip of the icebergs. But how many of you know some of us need to prioritize inviting God to send some folk in our life, practices in our life, so we can also deal with the parts of our life that are under the water? that often keep you from being able to live into what you are showing everybody at the tip of the iceberg. Oh, I know it's tough in here today, but it's all right because it's going to help somebody. Give a neighbor a high five and tell them I got to go beyond the tip of the iceberg. I got to do a little bit of work because what's going on underneath the water, underneath the surface, is going to keep you and I from being able to live out healthy relationships. It's, it's a badge of honor you need to get comfortable with. There's more to you than me. Not everybody deserves to see what's going on under the surface. That's the first thing you need to realize. So you should be discriminatory about who you let get in the surf underneath the water. Like, no, nah, you a tip of the iceberg friend. <laughs> but you ain't got to tell them that. You just, you say it in your mind. Oh, tip of the iceberg tip of iceberg. Is that T-O-I? You a T-O-I. You, you a T-O-I friend. Huh? And just use code. Yeah, what's a T-O-I friend? Just couldn't, don't, just, I'm just trying to help us both. Because how many know you let too many people, the wrong people under the surface, they'll wreck you and them at the same time. You a tip of iceberg, you know, and, and you won't have that many people God's going to place in your life. You will have someone, though, so don't you be walking around, oh, ain't nobody's willing, I'm, I'm too good, you know, ain't nobody handle this, you know. <laughs> That's not God either, amen. Tell your neighbor, you ain't that special, praise God, amen. You, you special, but you ain't that special. <laughs> ain't nobody, ain't, God ain't nobody deal with this, I'll just be by myself. God needs us to have practices and people so we can deal with the stuff on the inside. The trauma, the pain, the betrayal, all those things that, that just hover underneath the water. And I want you to know that you not dealing with it won't make it go away. It, it, it's not going nowhere. And you're going to run into folk, like when you talk about Iceberg detection, they got special sonars. 
watch, you know, they got people watching on a ship looking for icebergs because time has taught them that if there's an iceberg there, there's some stuff under the water that can take this whole thing down. So don't we, don't you get so, you know, uh, huh, uh, deceived, you know, practice self-deception. Because how many know self-deception is a real thing? Like, you know, it's not me. <laughs> it's all of us. <laughs> I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. It's all of us. So the first set of questions, what lies beneath your iceberg? Out of you of first yourself and others. If I'm going to be in a healthy relationship, so I need to, on, on your job, you need to be answering this question. You be on your job, folks will trigger you. You don't even understand why. You keep blaming. Now, if you got 10 jobs and you've been fired off every job for the same thing, it ain't because of the person you're working with. These people don't know each other. Like my dad said, everybody in the world can't be wrong, son. You know, I used to blame everybody else. Oh, they, daddy, they did this. Daddy, they, dad said, son. Everybody can't be wrong. Man, I use that on other people now. Be like, I don't know, you're on your 10th job. They, they just a hater. <laughs> Maybe you giving them a lot of material to hate. Deal with the iceberg. What is it that's underneath that you're going to have to deal with? You can't be in a relationship with yourself. And this is the hardest part to be in a relationship with this country. Because we have such a Hey, Lord, I, you know, you see, y'all know I, I always figure out a way to, to, bring, to bring this stuff into my sermons. But, you know, people in this country <sighs> believe some of the most ridiculous myths about this country's origins. You know, I, I was, this, this, uh, uh, Preacher, uh, uh, Paula White, we, you know, I, she said something ridiculous, another ridiculous thing about supporting Donald Trump. So I put, put on, 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 on uh, Instagram that, you know, uh, she's a false prophet. You up to her dirty tricks. You know, she reached out to me. We ended up having a conversation because she felt like I shouldn't have put her on blast. I said, well, you, you just got to stop being a false prophet. I don't want to put you on blast, but I mean, I got to call it like I see it, praise God. <laughs> But in some of her remarks, this is a fascinating, this is not just Paula White, but there's a lot of people, you know. She, you know, when, when the pilgrims first came, they, they put white crosses in the ground and, 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 and declared this country to be a, 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 a committed to spreading the gospel to the world. I said, now that's, that's one rendition of what happened when the pilgrims came. Man. But how many know that, that, that underneath the, 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 the water of the iceberg of our country's uh, self-deluded exceptionalist narrative of ourself, there's imperialism, genocide, uh, 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 pillage and exploitation and racism and human hierarchy and all kind of stuff. And, and for some of us who are socially at the, the bottom of the American totem pole, we get to experience that much more frequently than everybody else. So it's like, I ain't got to explore that iceberg. I'm at the bottom of that joint, praise God. And we hollering up to you, hey, there's some mess down here. And y'all up there at the iceberg? No, there's not. Look at how beautiful the tip of the iceberg is. It's hard to be in a relationship with this country when you are aware of all this nastiness and sin and ugliness that's a part of this country's fabric, and then you got to be the cult one dealing with it. That's why some of us have such a tension with this country. And then folk who ain't, don't have attention, they look at us like we just ungrateful. Well, you should be glad you're in America. Like Kanye silly self, talking about, you know, all this was a choice. You're like, boy, you need to go take a nap. <laughs> take your medicine, go do something. Somebody say amen, right? So if we don't tell the truth about ourselves, about the institutions, about our relationships, the things underneath the water, those things will wreck us. 
So we got to explore the icebergs. What are the tools? They use sonar. What are the tools you and I get to use? Therapy. You better go get you a good therapist. Maybe get two of them jokers, amen. You know, just in case one is not available. Or you fall out, you know, I fell out one of my therapists. I'm, I'm taking a time out off you. I'm going to go to this one today. Because you, you either too much truth or not enough truth. I don't know which one it is, but I can't deal with you today. Right? Have you some prayer partners, some friends. Engage in some practices of healing. So you can deal with the stuff underneath the water. What tools must you employ to cultivate curiosity and courage to confront and heal what lies beneath? Curiosity in relationships is much greater than condemnation, more effective than condemnation. If you're curious, how you know you'll ask more questions than you'll lead with assumptions. Now, I am I'm someone who struggles with some of this. Because, you know, when, when I get petty and in my feelings, you know, my wife, my coworkers, uh, people here I work with, they can say certain things to me, and I'll just be already on defensive, like, whoa, whoa, what, what you talking about? I'm like, hey, man, take a chill pill. This is a question of curiosity, not condemnation. But I had to do some work because, you know, I was used to being around people who would ask you questions to try and expose your weakness rather than being curious. You ever been in a situation where you know you, you ask me questions, you, these questions ain't to help me. You not ask me this question to learn more, you ask these questions to make me feel less than who I am. But not every person God places in your life is that way. So you have to lead with some curiosity and be open to other people's curiosity. Why are you acting like this? Did, 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 did someone hurt you? Curiosity versus condemnation. You will get further in your relationships if you ask more questions. And you that are asking questions, you will get further if you do less condemning. Healthy relationships. And then what are the practices to heal? So particularly all of us who live here in the Bay Area, you know, I, 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 I thank God for all the nature and, and, and the weather. I'm, I'm growing to love it. You know, we grew up, I was in Chicago and talking to some people, and, uh, you know, I, it started snowing. My first day in Chicago, the first snow of the year. I'm looking at that, and saying, you know, there's nothing but the devil. I told him, I said, <laughs> I, I, I grew up thinking hell was hot until <laughs> I started traveling to the Midwest, and I'm convinced hell is cold. Touch your neighbor, amen. There, there ain't no fire in the hell I'll be going to. Man, that joint be colder than I'm just telling you. It's just snowing and you sitting outside. I, I have my little jean jacket on and no hat, no. And I'm just, I'm sitting in the thing. I'm like, what, what is this, you know? It's, it's, you know, so, so we, we ought to be thankful that here in the Bay Area you can walk outside. Look at the mountains and the water. We got manufacture, manufacture lakes, Lake Merritt and stuff, you know. And you can, don't swim in it, but you can walk, you can walk around it. <laughs> Practices that will heal you. Hello, somebody. What are the practices that will heal you? Remind you that you are connected to something greater than your worst condition. That God has given you an abundance of gifts that you just have to do some little bit of work excavating, refining. And there's going to be some ugliness in your life, but the ugliness is not your full reality. It's just a temporary situation. That's my final point. You got to learn to see what you can't see. If you're in these relationships, you got to learn to see what you can't see. The text, it says it like this, the things we see now are here today, going tomorrow, but the things we can't see now, those things are eternal. That there's some things that God wants you to be able to anticipate happening in your life and in your relationships that you can't see because you are dealing with the misery of your current condition. 
You're dealing with the trauma and the pain of your current crisis. But God wants you and I to be people who can put on those glasses and those lens of eternal and divine significance. It's like you going to, 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 to uh, watch the movie and, and, and you in a 3D movie without your glasses on. And everybody around you, they woo, ah, they moving. And you sitting there, what's wrong with these people? Crazy. No, they're not crazy. They got a different set of eyes. You could be sitting right next to somebody and they don't have what you have. To see that there's more to you and this moment than what you can see. And I believe God is trying to get some of us to put some of these glasses on so we can see even in our relationships and in our conditions that there's more going on than what I can see with my O2 eye. And by faith, I believe that I can see those things that are not as though they already are. By faith, I can look through the eyes of love and peace and joy and hope. And I can believe that even though my relationships or my conditions or my circumstances are terrible right now, I believe God can help me to see over the horizon that God is doing a work that I can't fully understand or I can't fully anticipate, but I know that things are getting ready to shift in my favor. And how many know when you believe God's getting ready to shift something in your favor, even though you're going through some trial, you'll go through with a different kind of confidence that trouble won't last always. Uh, uh, you know, when you're young, you think that trouble is here to stay. But the older you get, you start to have a testimony that trouble won't last always. Uh, you start to live a little bit longer and you start to remember that if God brought me out of that thing last time, uh, then God will bring me out of this thing again. No, that I will not be a prisoner of my current condition no, when God has shown me that the future is much brighter than my past. Do I have somebody who believes that trouble won't last always? I'm going to believe that with the eyes of faith that I can see what I can't see. You are a piece of work today, but I see God's masterpiece in the future. You are something that I I don't understand today uh, but I see God turning you around into what I need and what I believed uh, I thought that what I was going through today uh, would be the thing that would define me for tomorrow uh, but I hear God saying uh, the best uh, is yet to come uh, that you ain't seen nothing yet uh, do I have somebody uh, who can look back over your life uh, and say God he brought me out God he turned me around God he made a way out of no way and that's why I can believe that trouble is just a temporary thing weeping may endure for the night but joy joy is coming in the morning give your neighbor a quick high five and tell him there's more to me than what you see so look at me with the eyes of faith look at me and see hope see possibility see victory see power see deliverance see victory see power see deliverance whatever you do look at me the way God sees me I'm fearfully and wonderfully made shout hallelujah come on stand with me everybody grab somebody's hand just look at them and tell them there's more to me than what you see there's more to you than what I see. I believe God is not through with us yet. And that our relationships are some of the key tools that God will use to help us cultivate eyes of faith and possibility. Don't lose hope in your relationships. Even when they change. Amen. Your relationships may not stay the same. All relationships change over time. 
But God, help me to see that what the change brings is a better me, a more full me, a more empowered me, a more authentic me. Bless the person I'm touching, God. Give them your peace. Give them your strength. Give them your power. Give them your anointing. May they know and may they see the beauty, the giftedness that is inherent in their body, in their soul, and in their spirit. And may they also know that because of life, the vicissitudes, the challenges, the vulnerabilities, we all place masks and costumes on, and we've forgotten to take them off. And we need your help, Lord, to help us not lose our authentic self in these masks and in these costumes. So bless my neighbor, God. May their authentic self begin to shine through. May they find people, may you assign people to their life that can help them see who you've created them to be. Lord, may they explore these icebergs, not just at the tip of the iceberg level, but may they get underneath these surfaces, Lord God, where trauma and pain and resentment, where those things exist and get in the way of them being able to be free to love, to receive love, free to heal and to receive healing, free, Lord God, to be who you've created them to be. Bless them, Jesus. Squeeze their hand gently. Give them what they need right now. Help them to know, God, that the best is yet to come. And we'll say thank you. Lift those hands right where you're standing. It's me, oh Lord, and I need you. I need you, Lord, in my life today. I need you to help remind me of all these truths that I've heard today. These things that are meant to help me be better. Help me be more free and whole. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Lord. It's, it's me and I stand in the need of prayer. It's not my mother. It's not my father. It's not my sister. It's not my brother. But it's me, Lord, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. Say it again, I need you, Lord. Lord, do for me that which no one else can do. Give me a radical healing. Give me a full restoration. Help me to see, God, who you created me to be today. An instrument for your glory and your pleasure. We'll say thank you, God. We'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, keep those hands up.